Our last chapter, investment companies. The most familiar type of investment company is a mutual fund. Mutual funds are financial institutions that pool the funds of both individuals and companies and invest in a portfolio of assets. Those assets can be stocks, bonds, or some combination of various asset types. The first mutual fund was established in Boston in 1924, so they've been around for a pretty long time. While Vanguard was the largest fund in 2019, as of June the 1st, 2020, BlackRock funds had surpassed them with $6.47 billion in assets under management. Vanguard is a close second at $6.2 billion. Hedge funds are a special type of investment pool that accepts funds only from wealthy individuals, and we'll discuss them in more depth later in this chapter. There are two major types of mutual funds, open-end and closed-end. The ones you're probably familiar with are open-end funds, like Fidelity. An open-end fund sells shares directly to investors and redeems them, buys them back, outstanding shares at any time at their fair market value. Two subcategories are money market mutual funds who invest only in money market, short-term debt instruments, and tax-exempt funds, which invest only in tax-exempt securities, like municipal bonds. By 2018, in the U.S. alone, there were 9,599 mutual funds managing net assets under management of $17.71 trillion. The biggest growth in mutual funds has been driven by retirement accounts, which frequently offer mutual funds as a 401k option. Mutual funds are the second most important group of financial intermediaries, second only to commercial banks. This is figure 17.2 from the text. It describes the interest rate spread and net new cash flow to taxable retail money market funds, 1985 to 2016. The spread is between the money market mutual fund and money market deposit accounts. Holdings in money market mutual funds grew significantly from 1980 till 2008 when they began to decline. In 1999, 25.8% of mutual fund assets were in money market funds. By 2002, this had risen to 37.9%. By 2007, it had declined back to 279 Money flows to money market funds are inversely related to growth in the stock market, since short-term funds are parking places, waiting for better long-term rates. Traditionally, money market investments had a fixed $1 net asset value, so they would be comparable to bank deposits. As part of increased oversight from the Dodd-Frank bill, these accounts were forced to trade at varying net asset values so that investors can understand the risk they face in these investments. In September, the primary reserve fund's net asset value dropped below a dollar. This is called breaking the buck. This is driven by losses on Lehman Brothers commercial paper. This led to a contagion run on money funds, with over $200 billion withdrawn in just a few days. From September 2008 to September 2009, the Treasury insured money market mutual funds. The guarantee ran out September 19, 2009. The money market mutual fund values now fluctuate with the market and trade at their true net asset value. There are relatively low barriers to entry in the mutual fund industry. The largest mutual fund sponsors have not increased their market share. Notably, the 25 largest companies managed 75% of assets in 1995 and in 2016, but the composition of the top 25 has changed, with 15 of the 25 largest firms in 2016 they weren't in the top 25 in 1990. The mutual fund industry can be thought of as having two sectors, short-term funds and long-term funds. Under short-term funds, we have money market and tax-exempt funds we've talked about. Long-term funds include equity funds invested totally in stock, bond funds invested totally in bonds, and hybrid funds that combine the two asset classes. Money market mutual funds are viewed as an alternative to interest-bearing bank deposits. Bank deposits are less risky and FDIC insured, but generally provide lower returns. The majority of mutual funds are owned by individuals, more in long-term than short-term funds. Over 40% of U.S. households owned mutual funds in 2016, probably primarily in their retirement accounts. The average investment was $94,300 spread over four funds. This table recaps the number of mutual funds by year and by category from 1980 to 2016. Notice the huge growth between 1990 and 2000 in virtually all types of mutual funds.
Table 17.4 compares the characteristics of the typical mutual fund owner, 1995 and 2016. The median age has gone up, as has the household income and household financial assets. Opened-in mutual fund shares increase and decrease as investments are made and redeemed. Closed-in mutual funds issue a fixed number of shares when they're created. They invest in securities like any other mutual fund, but once created, the shares trade on the open market like a share of stock. A unit trust is a specialized type of closed-end fund. Real estate investment trusts, or REITs, invest in mortgages or property. They have a fixed termination date at which time the assets are sold and the fund closed. Mutual funds are required to provide a prospectus to potential investors. The prospectus must include certain specific required information. The slide says the prospectus contains a list of the securities invested in by the fund. This does not mean a list of each specific stock held, as that would make public the fund's investment strategy. It will include a description of so much in large cap stocks, etc. In 1998, the SEC mandated that prospectuses had to be written in plain, understandable English, not legalese. As mentioned, mutual funds are required to include the fund's specific objectives in the prospectus. It must also include one, three, and five-year historical return information, and it also must detail fees and the effect of those fees over time. There is usually not any comment on risk. Index funds are mutual funds which invest in the securities of a specific index in the same proportion as the securities in the index. Clearly, this doesn't involve much research or management, so the fees are very low. In 2016, there were 406 of these funds. Exchange-traded funds, or ETFs, were designed by the American Stock Exchange to replicate a specific market index, originally the SPIDER, which tracked the S&P 500. ETFs are traded on exchanges at market-determined prices. Since they track an index, management fees are low. One major difference between ETFs and index funds is that traditional mutual funds only trade once a day at the closing net asset value. ETFs trade all during the day at market prices, and they can be sold short and purchased on margin. ETFs also have a tax advantage, as there are no capital gains distributions to add to an investor's tax liability in a given year. Together, these features allow for better hedging and arbitrage strategies. Remember that returns on any asset can only be earned in two ways, cash or capital gains. Well, with mutual funds, there are two types of capital gains. Income and dividends are the cash return. Capital gains are recognized on assets bought and sold by the fund. Capital appreciation is recognized on assets held by the fund. So you may see three components of return on a mutual fund. Much like futures contracts, mutual funds are marked to market at the close of trading every day. Mutual fund prices are quoted as a net asset value, NAV. It's the fund's net assets, assets minus liabilities, divided by the number of shares outstanding. Example 17.1 demonstrates the computation of the NAV of an open-end mutual fund. This fund owns 4,000 shares of Sears, 1,200 shares of ExxonMobil, and 1,500 of AT&T. They have no liabilities and 15,000 shares outstanding. First thing we do, calculate the market value of each stock in the fund. Sum these and divide by the number of shares. Net asset value, $15.402. Continuing example 17.1, this reflects the result of the change in share prices. Same number of shares in each stock, but updated prices. Compute the market values, sum and divide. New net asset value, 16.807. Example 17.2 shows the result of a change in the number of shares in the fund. Stock prices are back to the original ones in 17.1. The mutual fund sells 1,000 new shares at the net asset value of 15.402, so they brought in $15,402. With the newly added cash, they purchased 700 shares of Sears at $22 a share, $15,400. And we'll see all this on the next slide. The original data, the added dollars to the fund, the updated fund data, and the effect on the fund values. New net asset value, 16.916. Mutual funds have various fees which must be disclosed in their prospectus. A fund can have two types of sales loads, which we'll look at in oncoming slides. 12B1 fees are basically distribution costs, marketing expenses. 
12B1 fees cannot exceed 1% of annual net assets for a load fund, nor 0.25% for a no-load fund. About two-thirds of the funds offer different classes with different load fees. As the name implies, a load fund charges an upfront commission when the shares are bought. A no-load fund has no upfront fee. Example 17.3 demonstrates the calculation of mutual fund's cost. The investment is $10,000. The fund has a 4% front-end load, so 4% is $400, making the net investment $9,600. The fund has a management fee of 0.75%. This pays for the professional fund management. The 12B1 fee is 0.10%. Annual operating expenses average 0.85%. So looking at the fund's year one results, the fund returned 5%. So 5% of 9,600 is $480. The investment's year end value, 9,600 plus 480, $10,080. The average value during the year, 9,840. The operating expense fee is applied to this average value. $83.64. So the net end of year value, $10,080 minus the $83.64 equals $9,996.36 for a net return on the $10,000 of a minus 0.04%. Same investment year two. 5% return again, going through the same calculations, yields a year end value of $10,409.08. So over the two-year period, the return on investment was 2.02%. You can see in the lower table the total upfront fees paid of $400. Operating expenses for the two years, 170.73. So in total, you paid $570.73 and got a return of 979.82. Net return, 40908. And you can see how you can use your calculator to find the holding period return of 2.02. This places both two years of the calculations all on one slide. This data is from 2016. The Vanguard 500 index admin was and in 2020 still is the largest mutual fund by assets under management. This fund tracks the S&P 500 index. Note that Vanguard dominates the large fund list. The top eight funds have no initial fees and the top five Vanguard funds charge no initial fees and have 10-year returns over 7%, five-year returns over 16%. Continuing table 17-6, now we have some load funds in the list with initial fees at 5.75%. Note that the return on these funds is not better than the ones with no fees. Here's another example of the effect of loads and fees on return. $10,000 investment in a 6% load fund. Estimated annual expenses, 1.35%, charged against average assets. Gross return, 11.5%. Actual initial investment net of load, 9,400. Gross return results in year-end investment, $10,481. Average asset value, $9,940.50. Fees charged on the average value, $134.20. Net after fees, $10,346.80. Net first year return, 3.47%. Mutual funds are heavily regulated, primarily because they manage the funds of many small, typically unsophisticated investors. The SEC is the primary regulator through the Securities Act of 1933 and the Securities Exchange Act of 1934. The 1933 Act requires a mutual fund to file a registration statement with the SEC and sets rules and procedures regarding a fund's prospectus. The 1934 Act makes the purchase and sale of mutual fund shares subject to anti-fraud provisions. It also requires mutual funds to provide full and accurate information to prospective buyers. In addition, the 1934 Act appointed the National Association of Security Dealers to supervise mutual fund share distributions. The Investment Advisors Act and Investment Company Act of 1940 focused on preventing conflicts of interest, fraud, and excessive charges and fees. The Insider Trading and Securities Fraud Enforcement Act of 1988 required mutual funds to develop mechanisms to avoid insider trading. The Market Reform Act of 1990, passed following the market crash of 1987, allows the SEC to introduce circuit breakers to halt trading on exchanges. And finally, the National Securities Market Improvement Act of 1996 
discussed in Chapter 16, applies to mutual funds in terms of exempting them from state oversight. Even with all the regulation aimed at protecting investors in mutual funds, abuses still do occur. Market timing refers to short-term trading that profits from out-of-date prices. Late trading describes buyer sales after prices have been set at 4 o'clock. Directed brokerage is the act of improperly influencing investors. And improperly assessed fees usually means investors are tricked into buying what they think is a no-load fund, but end up paying upfront fees. As the slide states, during the 1990s, mutual funds were the fastest growing financial institution in the United States. They are particularly attractive to small investors for a variety of reasons, low initial investment requirements and professional management. Many investors were in introduced to mutual funds through their 401ks, which allowed them to allocate among several funds in a family, such as Fidelity. The growth slowed around 2001 in most countries, reversing a strong growth trend. By the mid-2000s, growth started up again, but declined again during the crisis in 08 and 09. During the 1990s, mutual funds were growing very fast. Investments in mutual funds outside the United States increased over 187% from 1999 to 2007, while growth in the U.S. was about 75%. But non-U.S. mutual funds suffered bigger losses, 34% during the crisis versus U.S., about 20%. By 2016, worldwide investments in mutual funds had increased by 127% over 2008, while U.S. investments increased 88.8%. Hedge funds are a specific type of mutual fund that solicits from wealthy investors who are deemed sophisticated, such that they do not need the type of protection given to the average investor. Hedge funds with assets under management less than $100 million are not even required to register with the SEC and as subject are subject to less oversight. Hedge funds are not truly hedged. They can take on significantly more risk than a traditional mutual fund. They do not have to publicly disclose their activities, so they offer a high degree of privacy. While smaller hedge funds do not have to register, those with assets over $100 million are required by Dodd-Frank to register with the SEC under the Investment Advisors Act. Regardless, hedge funds are prohibited from illegal trading. Hedge funds can avoid regulation by keeping their number of investors below 100, requiring investors to be accredited, meaning net worth over a million dollars and an annual income minimum. The concept of a hedge fund is that the fund can use strategies to control and modify its risk. Hence, the fund can at times take on much more risk. They can sell short. They can use derivatives. They can employ leverage to increase their returns. In reality, much of hedge fund returns results from the use of leverage. The most spectacular hedge fund failure was long-term capital management. The fund engaged in risky arbitrage strategies during a period of global economic turmoil, but even long-term capital management would not have failed if they had not employed excessive leverage. Without registration, complete data on hedge funds is, is clearly lacking. Hedge fund managers are paid a fee based on assets under management, usually 1.5 to 2 percent. Where managers really make money, is in performance fees, a share of the fund's profits, and the average is about 20%. Frequently, there's a hurdle rate, a benchmark that must be hit before the performance fee kicks in. A high watermark keeps managers from receiving a performance fee unless the fund hits the highest net asset value ever recorded. Even with restrictions, these high performance fees lured a lot of high performing mutual fund managers to the hedge fund side. The Cayman Islands houses about 75% of offshore hedge funds. Three basic types of hedge funds. The most risky hedge funds use market timing and direction trading strategies. They go for high returns using leverage. They invest based on anticipating events, risk arbitrage. The moderate risk hedge funds have a market neutral or value orientation that favors longer term investment strategies. The risk avoidance hedge funds take a market neutral approach and strive for consistent returns with low risk. These were the largest hedge funds in the U.S. in 2016. You probably never heard of any of them, which is the point. They offer privacy for high wealth investors willing to take on more risk. Thanks to Dodd-Frank, large hedge fund advisors do have to report financial information. This is an effort to limit systemic risk. The Fed can also intervene if a fund is deemed large enough or interconnected enough to present a systemic risk. 
While mutual funds in the U.S. are highly regulated and required to register with the SEC, hedge funds, as we've said, operate under two major exemptions, less than 100 investors and only accredited investors. Hedge funds are only sold through private placements. They're not advertised to the general public, which explains why most of us have never heard of any of them. This table lists the top hedge funds by earnings 2008 and 09. I would bet none of the names on this list are familiar to any of us. Note all the negative returns in 2008, but the spectacular returns in 2009. There have been some problems with hedge funds. When two of Bear Stearns' hedge funds collapsed, it led to losses of $1.6 billion and ultimately the bankruptcy of the company. Bernie Madoff ran an old-fashioned Ponzi scheme, claiming to have $65 billion in stock holdings that were fictitious. He apparently had not purchased stocks since the mid-1990s. Madoff was arrested in late 2008, and the firm was liquidated after his sons turned him into authorities. Madoff pled guilty to 11 felonies and was sentenced to 150 years in jail with restitution charges of $170 billion. The Madoff fund was not a hedge fund, but acted as a fund of hedge funds. A Ponzi scheme is a con where high returns are paid to fund investors with money paid in by new investors. The scheme can grow as long as sufficient new funds are paid into the fund. Word of mouth of the high returns offered by the Madoff fund led to large fund inflows for a time. Investors need to be skeptical whenever a fund offers higher than normal returns. The founder of Galleon and 20 others were charged with criminal violations of insider trading laws. The firm had allegedly used inside information from consulting groups to invest. In July 2013, SAC Capital was charged with pervasive large-scale insider trading, where apparently the firm's main competitive strategy was to obtain and trade on non-public information. The government sought a $2 billion settlement. And this ends Chapter 17 and the lectures for this class.